Okay, our final segment this morning with Dr. Dennis McLeod talking about uh, seasonal affective disorder, a little bit depression, feeling down in the dumps and the like. All right, so if someone's watching um, right now, doctor, and they've got a, a sense that, um, all right, I've heard the show. This makes sense to me. I don't feel well. What's the first thing that they can do when the show's over? I mean, literally, first thing, and they, they've just thought about this for the first time now, even though they've been feeling lousy for a while. What do you suggest they do, first thing? Oh, hey, oh there you go, go ahead. Your mic was off, go ahead. Sure, I was saying you already noticed, you already did the first thing, which is noticing you're not feeling great, right? That can be hard to do in the first case. Okay. The second thing, is to, to reach out to friends and family and say, hey, have you noticed, you know, what have you noticed when it comes to my mood? And, and notice that like the, the fuel for this fire is gonna be you being able to notice what's happening in you and getting that out of you. Notice what's happening in you and getting that out of you. And so the first place where you might wanna get it out is friends or family. Um, so that's what I think the first thing is. I got so a call, long so list call of a friend or a family. Call a friend or a family and say, look, I'm feeling lousy. Have you noticed? And they may say, look, we haven't been around you. We haven't noticed it, but what's wrong? And so you, you kind of voice it there. And they say, well, we're sorry you feel bad. We're here for you if you need it, if you want to come over, whatever. So then you get off the phone with them. Then what do you do? Yeah, I think other social supports, right? People you trust. So, you know, maybe going to church members, maybe talking to other people who can be really supportive, you know, whatever your social support looks like, right? As wide as you can possibly get, letting folks know that, hey, I'm not sure if things are just right. Um, and getting that feedback from other folks so that you can land, right, when it comes to um, if things go awry, right? If things really don't go right, then you got other folks that are at your fingertips to check in and say, hey, how you doing? You know, we remember things weren't great last week. How you doing this week? You know, and I think that's great. And seeking it out, it's just, I wonder sometimes, you probably encounter this, some people may be more hesitant to share their personal feelings with others either because of privacy issues or they feel it's a sign of weakness. Um, we've heard that yes. before, and, that, and that's wanting to try to get past it. And I've, I've always felt myself, and I've told this to others, that it's a sign of strength if you have the courage to be open about it. But there are a lot that say, mm -hmm. look, I don't want people to know I have a, I'm vulnerable. Um, and so they choose not to share it, and they keep it inside. So, of course, it manifests itself in other ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that you're, you know, again, I, I really do think that's true. I've heard that all too often, uh, depending on how we're socialized, oftentimes I hear that from males um, when it comes to, you know, feeling like a, a sign of strength is being able to struggle and do it alone. And to your point, it is actually really strong of you to not do that, right? To do the thing that is difficult, that is hard, which is share that you're struggling. And again, there are great benefits of sharing that you're struggling with the right people, right? With safe people that are in your social network because then they're able to offer you a little bit more support. And oftentimes what I've learned is when I share with my friends or my family, you know, my, my social support network, and they always, always, always say, man, me too. Yeah. Right? And, and that more connection, and again, kind of buffers against some of those depression symptoms. That's, That's number point. two. Yeah, feeling that you're not alone. Now, but, but keep this in mind too, and let's remind folks there is always help. There are people out there that for whatever reason are alone. Okay, they don't really have someone to turn to. Maybe they don't go to a church. Maybe their loved ones live far away. Maybe, maybe they've outlived everyone. I don't know. And, and so if you feel as though you truly are alone, what are your options? Yeah, so then you mentioned privacy. I really like that point around, you know, well, some folks don't want to share with their friends or family members. I want to keep my, you know, personal information personal. And this is quite frankly why I have a job, right? I got some really, really cool training and lots of psychologists or other mental health professionals. They're literally bound by law not to share the, the things that you're struggling with with right. other people. So kind of step three, right, is being able to talk to, let's say, a primary care doctor or a, a doctor that you trust so that they can get you to someone like me, right, someone who can uh, kind of be there with you and who has got some really good training on how to help you get through the darkness. Yeah, it's interesting, too, uh, and maybe you can talk about how you go about finding um, a psychologist to help you, because um, I, I know just from talking to friends, I, I, I've talked to psychologists before. It's been quite a while since I've had any counseling, but, um, you know, I hear that getting an appointment with a psychologist these days, especially here in Middle Tennessee, get in line. Get in line. Now, I have not experienced that myself recently. I have, I have not tried, but I haven't needed it. But um, I've heard it's hard. I mean, you guys are very busy. Uh, what do you recommend on that front and how to go about finding a psychologist that will be able to see you? 
You are very right. Uh, psychologists are very busy, and my friends that are all over the state that are psychologists or other mental health professionals, they are very, very busy, more so now in the past few years, uh, in part because of uh, COVID, but also with so more stress being in the world, but also I think because a lot of us are doing telehealth, which means that the, the, the net is a bit wider for the number of patients that we can see, right? Which is a good thing, but also means that we're very busy. Um, one of the other way, one of the ways that folks can uh, kind of figure out how to get to a mental health professional, the way that I did the last time I saw a therapist, I cast the widest net you could imagine. I mean, I called 10, 20 different therapists and I was like, you know, I sent some emails, I made phone calls because I was like, I want to cast a really, really wide net so that when, when someone's available, I am available. I'm ready and willing uh, to get going. Um, and also knowing what your options are, right? I talked to my insurance company and again, bringing people in to support you because you may not have the technology, you may not know um, how to get access to all these things, but talking to your insurance company, you know, who's in network, who's out of network, you know, who do you suggest, who, who's seeing patients? Sometimes there's a list there. And then there's some cool websites. One of my favorites, of course, is Psychology Today. Um, they have a long list of therapists, psychologists that are accessible, and you can sort them by your insurance or sort them by location, you know, by what they specialize in. All these tools are at your disposal, but even with all those things in your fingertips, you can also still struggle because people are busy. You are Absolutely right. Yeah, and um, I'm glad you mentioned this. In a lot of cases, not all of them, but insurance will cover sometimes these meetings with psychologists? Oh yeah, absolutely. Lots of psychologists um, will do private pay, which means that mm -hmm. insurance is not covering, but they have what they call sliding scale. Yeah. So you're able to come in at a lower rate and then kind of, you know, kind of work your way up to the rate, which I've found to be very beneficial. And most psychologists will offer something like that. But if not, they're also, uh, insurance can cover the vast majority of your expenses. And then you end up paying just your copay, which is an option as well. Um, so there are some some options there, even some free options that are out there. Uh, calling the local crisis area, not just in Nashville, but wherever you're located. Uh, calling your na national crisis hotline or crisis team. They can sometimes get you connected with the health department, and maybe there's some options that are low cost or no cost. And typically, well. sometimes a session can be an hour, hour and a half, or something along those lines. If you would, I know the difference here, but I mean, even for our viewers, just to lay it out for them, do from your perspective, and you are a psychologist, explain to the viewers so they understand when you need it and when you don't, the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Yes, great question. So um, psychology is primarily about you. I, I, what, the way I word it is, I'm a professional blind spot seer. I try to help folks with those things that they might be struggling with that they're not even aware that they're struggling with, right? Things that are in your subconscious that are playing a role in your everyday decisions, right? Beliefs that you might need to unhinge, uh, ways in which your thoughts and your beliefs or your, your behaviors all kind of tie in with your emotions, right? Ways you can get unstuck a lot of times, uh, whether it's depression, anxiety, it could be trauma, lots of things like that. Psychiatrists primarily prescribe Right, so they've got some training similar, right? They might be able to, to do some talk therapy as well, but primarily the, the training is through medical school. So psychiatrists are gonna be uh, the folks who are gonna get you to the Prozac or to the Wellbutrin or to the other uh, medications that we talked about earlier. Um, so that's the main difference in the two. And the point I made earlier, I think still stands that the best treatment for mental health, especially more severe mental health issues, is both having a mental health psychologist and having a psychiatrist, some medication and uh, therapy. Okay, time. and that, that's important to note then. So. Um, Again, you're right. Psychiatry, and it maybe has changed over the years to some degree, but it seems like a lot of psychiatrists now more or less are writing prescriptions and not doing as much of the, the couch talking as you used to hear them doing. So do you personally, we just have three minutes left, um, then do you work sometimes in conjunction with some of your patients with psychiatrists? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's not just your psychiatrist, right? The uh, like psychiatric nurse practitioners also can prescribe. And, and here at the center that I'm currently working at at Vanderbilt, we've got a psychiatric nurse practitioner. She's a rock star. And uh, we really do work hand in hand with some of our patients to make sure that they're getting you know, kind of both that, that, let's say that unhinging piece when it comes to the interaction between their thoughts, behaviors, beliefs, and also, you know, working with her to talk about what medications are working, what aren't, you know, what medication what changes might need to be made also with the psychologist you're more likely to spend more time with them and i think just that alone can be really helpful for your medication management yeah and and you did talk about you know the idea of 
you know, even if you have friends and you don't want to share it with them, I mean, there's, there's something to be said and in my own personal experience of going to someone that is a professional that has no other knowledge of you really and can just be an impartial sounding board completely. And it's weird. You don't think it's going to help sometimes and you go and you're talking and they're just listening and they're impartial. You don't even know that person that well if it's your first session. And it's strange when you leave, your problems may still be there, but you feel as though you can handle them better, <laughs> you know? It's yeah. just funny, after having talked about it with someone who is not there to judge you, who is not someone that knows you, is not an old buddy or not a family member, and they just kind of give it to you and you kind of can spill your guts and you walk out, that same issue may be there. It may still be dark outside, but all of a sudden you feel better. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like the metaphor you used earlier with the gym, you know, like just kind of going into the gym. You might struggle really to get there, right, to walk in the door, to do that exercise for that day, to stretch, yeah. do your yoga, meditate. Have you, but when you leave, I don't think I've ever left the gym and felt worse aside from maybe feeling sore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, if you may think, oh, that's not for me, I, sometimes, you know, just give it a try. And trust me, I, like myself, you'll be surprised. I was surprised. But trust me, it can make a difference. Hey, Dr. McLeod, appreciate you coming on. Uh, I, I think you're probably a terrific psychologist with your patients, and I really appreciate you talking this morning. It's a good thing to discuss. and let people know there's help out there. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the invitation. You know, I guess the last thing I'd say for folks is don't forget that if you need, if you have a mental health emergency, either call 911 or yeah. call the suicide hotline, you know, 800-273-TALK. So please give us a call if you need help. Happy to support folks. So I'm, I'm really me. glad you mentioned that. That's, that's the last thing. There are crisis hotlines out there available. Thank you again, sir, and uh, have a happy new year. Thank you, you too. All right, thank you for coming on. We'll take a break. When we come back, I'll have a programming note about tomorrow right after this.